I am excited to be able to share the seventh, sadly, the last message in our series, The Struggle is Real, Following Jesus When Life is Hard. And uh, just really grateful for the opportunity that Kondo and I have had to, to open God's word in areas of scripture that let us know that struggle and pain and hardship and suffering is not unique. It is not good theology to think that if you love Jesus and walk with Jesus, your life's gonna be easy and comfortable and without struggle. That's just not true. In fact, as we've seen, some of the most godly people in scripture had some of the most difficult trials, right? And some of the people that you know, maybe parents, grandparents, siblings, Dear, dear, dear friends who just love Jesus with their whole heart have some of the most difficult lives of anyone you know. It's not a reflection of God's love because God has created us in this life to in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the trial and the hard times, that that's one of the most important vehicles that he uses to draw us closer to himself to cry out and call upon him for his power in our lives. Because God knows we have such a tendency, don't we, to say, I got it. I got it. I'll call you when I need you. You know, for the real big stuff, I'll talk to you about it, Jesus. He wants us to draw on himself, on his power. He wants a close relationship with us every single day. And one of the ways that he gets us to draw closer to him is he reminds us how much we need him through the struggle, through the trial. I would say kind of our our go-to passage uh, for actually the first three weeks of this series, our go-to passage, a passage that kind of when I wanted to take a deep dive into is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, that's not going to be our passage for the morning. We're going to be looking in depth at another passage of Scripture. But I wanted to remind you by reading verse 9, what the Apostle Paul says is, is such a key critical purpose that God has for the struggles and the challenges and the hardship in each and every one of our lives. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 Paul says, but he, referring to Jesus, said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, look at this, so that Christ's power may rest on me. The apostle Paul learned that he had a propensity, a propensity as godly of a man as he was, to be self-sufficient. And so he had this thorn, this chronic uh, pain, whatever it was, emotionally, physically, spiritually, we don't know, this chronic pain in his life that drew him to dependence on Christ. And the beauty of that is that then we get the power of Christ in our lives so that we can live lives that... um, that just reflect the glory of Christ, not just that you're an awesome person, but that Jesus is an awesome Savior, right? Amen. The passage this morning we're going to kind of dive into is also in the book of 2 Corinthians. It's in chapter 1. I'd like you to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and we'll be looking at verses 3 through 9 this morning. So if you do have your Bible, you want to turn there. We also always like to put the, the verses up on the screen which we know is is helpful to a lot of people too. So after Paul gives his greeting in verses one and two, he jumps right in in verse three with these words. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. Now, we're going to get familiar with this word comfort this morning. Key word. In fact, 
in the seven verses that we're going to look at this morning, the word comfort appears nine times. Just in those three verses I read, five times. Quick little Bible study methods principle. When you're reading a passage of scripture and a word is repeated multiple times, chances are it's a really important word. Chances are it might even be the key word, the primary topic of that passage. And this word comfort is. Now, it's really important for me to share with you what the word comfort in this context means. And so since Kondo shared a Greek word with you last week, I am going to share a Greek word with you this week, okay? Because I like to share Greek words, and we will do that this this morning. The Greek word for comfort in this passage is the word parakaleo, parakaleo. Now, I want you to see how it's defined in its root meaning, to come alongside, translated comfort, translated consolation. Isn't that fascinating? To come alongside, inference in the context to help those in need. To come alongside to help one in need. That is the idea of this word. This word comfort that will appear nine times in this passage. To come alongside to help. Okay? Now I want you to really think about that because that's not typically what we think of when we think of comfort. We think of being comfortable, right? Um, Pleasure, pleasant, restful, spa day. You know, now there we go. That's the greatest comfort there is, right? That's fine, I guess. That's not the word in this context. So when we look at this word comfort, we're thinking about comfort has everything to do with somebody who is present with you, with the intent to help, okay? Some of you that that know Gospel of John know that The reference to the Holy Spirit, when Jesus said, I will send a Holy Spirit, is the comforter. And some of you maybe have heard that that word is paraclete, the noun form of this parakaleo word, the the verb for comfort, okay? So even the Holy Spirit is the great comforter we see in Scripture. Now, I want to read read these verses that I just read again with this definition of comfort in mind, okay? Okay? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God who comes alongside us to help, the God of all comfort, who comes alongside us to help in all of our troubles so that we can come alongside those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our coming alongside by, from Jesus to help us abounds through Christ, okay? Get the point? Get the point? Good. I wanna share three, I'm just gonna call them truths, from this passage about biblical godly comfort with you, okay? And I just really am praying God will use them to encourage your heart, because these are, these are amazing to me. Here's the first principle. It is part of God's character to comfort us. It is part of God's character to comfort us. Look with me again at verse three. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. He is the God who is loving, compassionate, comes alongside us. Over the years, my... (laughs) 40 years actually is what it is of of ministry that I've been involved in. Periodically, I'll sit with people and what will come out as we talk is their view of who God is. And possibly because of the family they were raised in or the church they were raised in, they say, when I primarily think of God, I think of somebody who is always angry with me. And it makes me want to cry. (laughs) 
My image of God, the way I grew up and what I heard about God is he's always inspecting me to, to discipline me when I do something wrong. I feel ashamed when I think about God because I fall so short. Some of you may have grown up in a church like that. Even more sadly, in a family like that. Our God is the God of all comfort. He's the God of all comfort. He is the father who is full of compassion. He is the father who calls you his beloved child. That's who you are to him. The God of all comfort. It is God's nature to come alongside and help us. That's his heart. That's his nature. That's what he thinks about you. I was trying to think of a good analogy of this, and I thought of a four-year-old, four-year-old, maybe a five-year-old, in the middle of the night, and the lightning and thunder starts, and you hear this blood-curdling scream from their bedroom. What do you do? You try to roll over and go back to sleep, right? (laughs) No, you're up, or you say to your spouse, can you go take care of her? (laughs) Yeah, I know that happens because I have done that. (laughs) One of my kids, uh, boy, that was a long time ago for me. But anyway, you go there. Why? Because they want you now. They want you now. Or one of those nightmare nights. You hear the scream. You hear the yell. You hear, mommy or dad. What do you do? They want you there. They want you present because you need to comfort them. You need to come alongside them to help, to comfort, to assure that they're going to be okay. That's the biblical word for comfort. I think it is so amazing. I love the fact that God has designed us to need to be comforted by a a person, himself to begin with, but by one another. Doesn't that say a lot about how God did not create us to survive by ourselves? To never let anybody know how hard things are or how bad things are or how deeply we're struggling? There are a lot of us that have that tendency. I'm fine. I'm great. You're great. No, I know you're not great. I know what's going on in your life. God has created us to need comfort, first from him and then from our brothers and sisters in Christ, from people who really, really love us. And you know where that all begins, what the source of that is? The father of all comfort. He is the source of all of that. So I think it's just so beautiful to remember that it's him, it's him. You know, I thought of a couple verses when I thought about this idea of of coming alongside, being present with us in our toughest times. And here's one verse that I thought of in the book of Hebrews. For he, God, has said, I will never leave you, you can say it with me, nor will I ever forsake you. That is a promise to you. He has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Is that comforting or what? (laughs) Wow. How about this one over in Romans 8? If God is for you, who can be? Thanks for saying it with me. I'm going to do it again. I'd love to hear your voices. (laughs) It's actually if God is for us. Okay, I'll say it the right way. If God is for us, who can be against us? I love that. I mean, it's like winner, champion, here we are. Because God's for us. I don't care who's against me. God is for me. That doesn't mean I'm gonna be, you know, a mean person or anything. 
but he's for me. He is for you. God is for you. He is always looking for your best. So God is always with you and God is always for you. Uh, done deal. Close the book. We're all good, right? That's how I feel when I think of those verses. Those are amazing verses to me. You know why? Because he is the God of all comfort and he knows that's what we need. We need his presence and we need to know he is for us. I mean, that in and of myself, in and of itself, my brothers and sisters, is worth the passage <laughs> for me. It's so awesome and so beautiful. Look with me at verse five. He says, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul in his writings, he, he used this phrase 30 sometimes, I can't remember exactly how many in Christ, in Christ, being in Christ. That's the idea of we are united with Jesus, okay? We are in Christ. So not only do we share incredible blessings by being in Christ, we share in his sufferings. In some places and in some settings for all of us, when you take a verbal strong stand for Jesus Christ, you will be persecuted you will be ridiculed. And we get so intimidated that even in our workplace or at school or wherever, wherever we might be, if we say, hey, above all else, I live for Jesus Christ. And we, and we use his name. Often, we don't do that because we're so afraid we're gonna get ridiculed or even persecuted at some level. We share in his sufferings because we are Christ's followers. That's true, but we also share in his blessings. And it says here, our comfort is abundant in Christ. That is such a beautiful thought to me. Sometimes the abundance is in the midst of some of the hardest things in life. You know, there's a verse over in Philippians chapter four that talks about the peace of God which surpasses all understanding surpasses all comprehension shall guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Any of you need the Holy Spirit to guard your heart and mind when you're just freaked out? I sure do. And I think God loves to hear us pray. Spirit of God, Holy Spirit, give me your peace. I so desperately need it right now. The comfort that he gives is often to give us that incomprehensible spiritual peace that only comes from him. That's why you have seen people, I have seen people that in the midst of some of the hardest issues of life are living faithfully, peacefully, in some ways even joyfully because God has in his grace poured out his peace in their hearts. Do you pray for that? Or do you pray in the midst of your hard situation, get me out of here. Get me out. Sometimes his uh, best response is not to get you out. It's to show you, I'm here. I'm here. I'm with you. It's such a beautiful thing. Don't be quick to bail, even on the trial. I mean, that sounds so weird. Of course, I want to get out of my hard time. That's not always the plan of the Father who will walk with you through it. Amen? That's the way it works. Okay, I got to keep moving. Let's, um, let's jump down to verse six. If we are distressed, Paul says, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same suffering we suffer for our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings so also you share in our comfort let me give you my second truth about comfort in this passage and that is is that it is our ministry mandate to comfort others that's what i'm calling it our ministry mandate this isn't optional my friends Look again, I mean, it, if we are distressed, verse six, if we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort. What's the point? 
When God comforts me or when other people comfort me, I have one response, to comfort you. <laughs> it's, this is the other-centered part of our trials, of our struggles, of our hardships. You see, as we've been talking about trials for the last, last six, now seven weeks, a lot of the focus in the struggle in the heart is what Jesus does for us. And that's beautiful, and that's correct, and that's right on. And along with sustaining us, he also transforms us, right, during the struggle. And he walks with us. But here's what this passage is so emphasizing. The comfort that I get from him needs to flow out of me to others. It's just, it's, that's exactly how it's supposed to work, my friends. Now, what does that look like? That looks like my story, your story of your life, especially the valleys, the challenges, the tough times, which are part of your story, your journey with Jesus story, can be used to bless and comfort others. Again, what's the definition of comfort? To come alongside those who need help, those are, who are in need. Here's the deal. Here's what I just am so convinced of. A lot of times, the really hard stuff of our past, we just want to forget and we never want to tell anybody. Why? Because maybe we feel ashamed. Maybe it wasn't just what was done to us. Maybe we made horrible decisions and horrible choices and sinful choices. And we feel ashamed of that. But maybe the presence and the comfort of Christ brought you to the point of repentance. It got, brought you to the point of Jesus turning your life around. That's your story. And I guarantee you that there are some people who have stories that are similar to your story. Who when they hear your story and they hear what Jesus did in your life, you talk about ministry, my friends. You talk about something that can absolutely, profoundly heal and help another person. You know, there are a couple of phrases that I, over the years, have heard people say that kind of bother me about this whole topic. I think they're usually spoken in a very well-meaning way. But here's one of them. I know exactly how you feel. And I just want to say, what? <laughs> no, you don't. Have you ever heard people say that to you? Oh, I know exactly how you feel. And it's like, why do you say that? Here's the other one. I really, emphasis really, I really understand what you're going through. Really? You really think you do? Now, obviously the reason why I don't like these phrases is the exactly and really words. Here's what I think is helpful. Here's what I think is helpful. There are people who have been through something similar to what you've been through. And often, some of their, what I like to call, grief journey. People go on grief journeys. Something horrible happens in your life. You grieve. And a lot of people deny that they're grieving, but they are, because you can tell. In a lot of ways, you can. They had a grief journey. Let's just say the loss of a, the death, unexpected death of a spouse unexpected death of a child, something else very, very tragic in their life occurs. A, a, a child who has gone off the deep end spiritually and then is addicted to, to drugs, whatever that situation might be. Even if their story is similar, it's not exactly your story. Why? Because we all have individual customized stories. And I think it's very hard for somebody to say, I know exactly how you feel, especially when they've not been through anything close to what you're going through. 
that's not the, that's not the phrase. I guess that's my point. But my point is, you know, uh, I I heard about your cancer diagnosis. Can I share with you that six years ago I was diagnosed with cancer as well? And if they probe and say, I'd like to hear your story. I'd like to hear how you dealt with it. And you have an opportunity to walk with them through your story and how Jesus showed up in amazing ways. Don't tell them this will be your story because it won't. Every story doesn't end the same way. But for somebody else, there's a credibility, isn't there? There's a credibility when somebody shares something with you and they have been through something very, very similar that encourages you. That is absolutely true with me. I think it's true with all of us. So what Paul is saying, and I'm calling it our ministry mandate, what Paul is saying is when you have a story where Jesus has walked with you through something very, very, very challenging and you've, quote, come out on the other end, you never fully come out on the other end, um, closer to him, loving him more, growing in your walk with him, that story needs to be told. That story needs to be shared because that story can be a great, great encouragement to a person who's walking through it. I wanna share with you, there are, there are a lot of Christians I run into when I talk to them, say, well, I don't really know, I, I don't know that I have a ministry, I don't know what I have to, to contribute, you know, I've made some bad choices in my life and I've had some super hard stuff in my life and I haven't achieved most of my life goals and, you know, they kind of talk this way and yet I'll say, you have a story. <laughs> your life has been hard. I, I, I know part of your story. Maybe I'd love to hear more of your story because out of that, you still are walking with Jesus. That is profound. You need to know that there are many, 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 many Christians who just chuck it all when life gets really hard. And they are so angry with God because God didn't do what they told him he should do. And when you stay with him, and especially when you draw closer to him, you have a powerful story to tell. You do, my friends. And maybe that's your ministry. Maybe that's your ministry, is to be able to speak out of the hard things of your life to others, to let them know that Jesus is there with them. We need to share our comfort with others. That's the point. Let me give you my third truth in just a second. I'm gonna, I think I'll read verses eight and nine first, and then I'll give you my third truth. Here's the third truth. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Wow, that's the Apostle Paul. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, but this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. Boy, is the Apostle Paul being uh, honest? <laughs> Or what? I mean, forthcoming. Here's my third truth. It is God's purpose to provide comfort that leads to dependence on Jesus. Comfort doesn't lead to, I got it, I'm fine. God, I'll call you when I need you. Comfort leads to greater dependence on Christ. That's what Paul is saying. Now, I think it's so amazing that in this whole topic, this whole subject that Paul is covering about comfort, he talks about probably some of the most difficult, painful moments in his entire life in ministry. Let me read these verses again because they are really profound. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received a death sentence. 
the sentence of death. I mean, despaired of life itself? He didn't want to be alive. The Apostle Paul? Wow. Uh, the, these phrases just, I think I have them again on the screen. Great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. Despaired of life, sentence of death. And again, it's so interesting to me that he talks about this in this whole wonderful passage about the father of all comfort and how we need, as God comforts us, we need to comfort one another. And he's gonna say, okay, that's not limited to just the okay times, you know, the the pretty good times of life. That's not just applicable to those times in your life. I'm gonna go hardcore on you about the worst times of my life But the context is still his comfort, God's comfort in Paul's life. I want to jump back to verse 6, the end of verse 6, for just a quick second, because this is so important for me to share with you. Last part of verse 6, he says, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. That phrase, patient endurance. Okay. God's goal of comfort, according to this passage, God's goal of comforting us, and again, I'm defining comfort biblically, parakaleo, uh, coming alongside to help, is not just to make you feel better. It's okay to feel better. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal of God stepping in and bringing this comfort to your life during your struggle is to produce in you and me patient endurance to continue to love and walk with and honor Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's the patient endurance. As opposed to saying, God, this is too hard. I quit. I'm out. I'm just going to take a deep plunge into my sinful, sensual desires. I'm out. No. The goal is so that you will endure, so that you will walk through that valley with him and draw closer and closer to him and love him more and more. Even, my friends, when every bone in your body and every emotion in your body wants to say, I'm out, this Christianity thing, Christianity thing does not work. I'm out. No. Patient endurance is what he's producing. And only he can provide what is needed. Because <laughs> we, we don't have it on our, in ourselves, do we? I don't have it. You don't have it. We don't. So remember the root idea of biblical comfort. I think that was my main point, coming alongside to help. He's our advocate. He's our counselor. He's our coach. He's our encourager. In fact, I love that picture in uh, Matthew chapter 11 where Jesus says, come to me all who are weary, heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my, what's the word? Yoke. It's it's the picture of the, the oxen, the team of oxen. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I'm gentle and humble of heart. You shall find rest for your souls. And then his last phrase, for my yoke is easy. My burden is life. When when you are teamed up with Jesus, he walks with you through the valley of the shadow of death. He's right there, teamed up with you. So he's also our teammate, (laughs) our best teammate. I want to I end with where we started six weeks, seven weeks ago, and that was just that one verse again in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, where Paul writes, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. 
So let me, I'm gonna encapsulate kind of not just this message, but kind of our series with these two sentences. Our struggles and hardships in life should compel us to cry out to Jesus Christ and receive his comfort and his power. Then we can extend it to others. Then we can extend it to others. That's our mandate of ministry. What we have received, we pour out to others.